The Emperor, Ferdinand I of Austria, is invariably overlooked. He is eclipsed by the figure of Metternich, a member of the Triumvirate which advised the Emperor, but de facto governed the Austrian Empire for the entirety of his reign, save for the tumultuous months following the Revolution of 1848, which forced the Emperor's abdication. Ferdinand's incapacity, his being wholly incapable of decisive action, in the words of his uncle, the Archduke John, was fully acknowledged. The Austrian system of government, laid out in the will of his father, good Emperor Franz, was designed to compensate for these deficiencies. The imbecile emperor, in the words of A.G.P. Taylor, was the product of a return to the Habsburg practice of cousin marriage. Ferdinand was not just the product of cousin marriage, but of a double first cousin marriage. Commenters of the time, and since, have made comparisons between Ferdinand and Charles II, the bewitched, the last Habsburg king of Spain. Had the Austrian Empire crumbled during the revolutions of 1848 and 9, ensuring that Ferdinand was the final Habsburg emperor, this analogy would be more poignant. As one can't really talk of Ferdinand as a ruler, his reign is reduced to a collection of memorable quotes and anecdotes. During his attempt to consummate his marriage, for example, the emperor suffered five epileptic fits. When the imperial cook told Ferdinand that he couldn't have apricot dumplings, as apricots were out of season, the emperor made an order to the cook, which legend has it was the only order of his reign. I am the emperor and I want dumplings. When revolution broke out, Ferdinand replied to Metternich, but are they allowed to do that? During a carriage ride through Vienna, when confronted by the jeers of rioters, the emperor remarked innocently to a courtier, My darling Viennese, just look at them, how excited they are. Nevertheless, the common assumption that the emperor was an imbecile is to deny him certain moments of lucidity, even of wit. During a riot, a stray cow entered the courtyard of the Hofburg Palace in Vienna. As his aides looked on at the rioters in terror, Ferdinand focused on the cow and quipped, That stupid cow is the first to enter the palace that wasn't thanks to nepotism. We should not let these anecdotes distract us from the implications of Ferdinand's reign. Were Joseph II alive, the great enlightened despot, he would have wept knowing the fate of the dynasty, his aspirations to autocracy had resulted in this. The Emperor Francis, inheriting the mantra of Josephinism, transformed the monarchy into something majestic yet banal. Following the survival of Austria in the Napoleonic Wars, the Emperor retained his power, but held it in reserve, himself manifesting as a figurehead monarch. The Emperor, as the father of his peoples, would be insulated from the decisions of his ministers, yet free to interfere and dismiss them at whim. The emperor had become that symbol of stability. It was the desire to place the dynasty on a pedestal, to enshrine the principle of primogeniture in the Austrian succession that caused Francis to overlook his far more capable brothers, the Archduke John and the Archduke Giles, as his potential heirs. Such a prospect stirred in the mind of Francis fears of an Austrian equivalent of the glorious revolution of 1688, where some ambiguous force, maybe even a parliament, could choose and potentially remove Habsburg emperors at whim. What greater expression of power could there be than designating the Kaiser's throne to an idiot without the oversight of any constitutional body? To hold the hereditary principle as sacrosanct was part of Francis's motivation to create the 1804 Austrian Empire in the first place. Then there was the overt hand of Metternich, 
conniving to maintain his influence over an easily influenced monarch. The succession of Ferdinand was a decision born of hubris, made at a time when Austrian influence was beginning to dwindle. If Francis represented unimpeachable stability, the symbol of a world unchanging, in Ferdinand, such stability was rigid, brittle, and ultimately illusory. This is a short segment from Wolfram Siemens Metternich. With the death of Emperor Franz on March the 2nd, 1835, in Vienna, the Habsburg monarchy faced the worst-case scenario. The monarch had strictly adhered to the normal line of succession, making his firstborn son, the Archduke Ferdinand, who was unfit for rule, his successor. In a confidential letter to all embassies of the Habsburg Empire, Metternich officially announced the death of the emperor. The people who revered him honoured him as the father, a title he truly deserved. In order to allay any suspicions, Metternich described the night of February the 28th in detail. The monarch partly dictated his will, partly wrote it himself. In a, in a separate letter to his son, the emperor formulated some brief instructions for legislation under the new government. The central passage said, Disturb nothing in the foundations and the edifice of state. Govern and change nothing. Honour the properly acquired rights. Maintain harmony in the family, and look upon it as one of the highest blessings. Emperor Franz set out three unambiguous principles for Ferdinand to follow. They defined the future structure of rule. Regarding Archduke Ludwig, place complete trust in my brother, the Archduke Ludwig, who always assisted me in so many important matters of government with his advice. Take from now his counsel in important domestic affairs. It should also be noted that of all the Emperor's brothers, Archduke Ludwig was by far one of the most unassuming, and that was intentional. Regarding Archduke Franz Karl, the Emperor's younger brother, keep the friendliest relations with your brother, and also keep him informed of all business. Regarding Metternich, repose in Prince Metternich, my truest servant and friend, that confidence which I have bestowed upon him through the course of so many years. Decide no question relating to public affairs or to persons without first hearing what he has to say, and I call upon him in his turn to act towards you with the same rectitude and devotion which he has always exhibited in myself, exhibited to myself. The doctor, when informing Metternich of the death of the emperor, famously quoted that the emperor is dead, Ferdinand is the new emperor, and you shall be his Richelieu. Richelieu, of course, being the infamous cardinal prime minister of the king of france louis the 13th according to the emperor's will a governmental body was to be created a state conference in which a triumvirate took on the role of regent for the formally appointed emperor ferdinand as metternich's opinion had to be heard on all questions whether pertaining to domestic or foreign affairs or to persons he took on the role of a prime minister with the authority to set policy guidelines on the basis of seniority, Ludwig represented the dynasty as a blood relation from the father's side, an agnat, but as the superior over Franz Karl, who was informally involved. This well-considered construction was designed to help overcome the weakness of the successor to the throne. There was no question that Ferdinand had to be considered a problematic case. He suffered from severe physical ailments, epilepsy, rickets, and hydrocephalus, he was, however, not all the feeble-minded ruler the all older literature portrays him to be. He spoke five languages, among them Hungarian, played piano, and dedicated himself to botany. His father had prepared him to be his successor, for instance having him crowned King of Hungary in 1830 in the Diet of Pressburg. The family archive holds moving letters that Ferdinand sent to his sister Mary Louise. They are warm-hearted and truly brotherly. During the revolution of 1848, he kept a diary in which he tried to reflect on the events. He also liked to keep diaries during his travels, for instance in Pressburg, Innsbruck and Olmutz. Metternich knew him well because he had given him lectures, such as on diplomacy, with the crown prince taking notes. We even have more detailed knowledge of the Emperor Ferdinand through his principal chamberlain, Count August Sigur Kavnak, who described him 
as selfless, dutiful, friendly and kind-hearted even towards his inferiors. All this, however, did not make him any more fit to govern. Ferdinand had to formally comment on all government acts that required the emperor's supreme resolution. One of his ministers, Metternich, or Kolovrat, formulated these for him, and he signed them. He was nevertheless capable of developing a will of his own, as on the question of which among a group of Italian prisoners who had been sentenced for political crimes should be granted amnesty. But he was incapable of governing independently in the way his father had done. Metternich always treated Ferdinand with the respect due to someone of his position, but the quality, the substance, the volume of his presentations for the Emperor steadily declined. Whereas in the case of France, he had covered the whole spectrum of politics, the presentations for Ferdinand increasingly limited themselves to formulaic summaries of the reports received from various embassies. The arrangements for the succession to the throne were highly controversial within the family. As a result, Metternich faced such powerful opposition that the system was, from then on, administered on an ad hoc basis rather than governed with a plan in mind. Archduchess Sophie, in particular, harboured an abiding grudge against Metternich and held him responsible for the Emperor's will. The Archduchess Sophie, as it happens, was the mother of the Emperor Franz Josef. The effects of this could be felt as late as 1851, three years into Franz Josef's reign. On September the 24th of that year, Metternich and his wife returned to exile, from exile to Vienna. Sophie invited Melanie for a meeting at the Hofburg on October the 6th. In the course of a long conversation, they spoke about Metternich's involvement in the original succession to the throne. Clearly unaware of what had actually happened, Sophie said, What I accuse your husband of is that he wanted something impossible, namely to lead a monarchy without an emperor and with a half-wit embodying the throne. When asked who should have replaced Ferdinand, Sophie responded that it should have been someone who was born with the qualities that were required for ruling. No doubt she had in mind the emperor's younger son, Archduke Franz Karl, her husband, and the father of the later emperor. However, the posthumous papers document this meeting with their overall tendency of protecting the imperial house from criticism. The disabilities of the legal successors to the throne were clearly visible. His simple mind could not be hidden in public. Then there were his epileptic fits, which were often misinterpreted by the outside world. He was unable to present himself well in public or to perform representational duties. The best he could do was simply to appear in his full imperial regalia and let people hail him, because he had a knack for looking gracefully at people and earned him the epithet Ferdinand the Benevolent. But conversations with him were, fi were filled with embarrassing moments. The wife of Tsar Nicholas I, Tsarina Charlotte of Prussia, the sister of the Prussian king Frederick Wilhelm IV, met Ferdinand in 1835 in Teplitz, and afterwards noted in her diary, Good Lord, I have heard a lot about him, about his short, ugly, stunted figure, and his large head, without any expression but that of a dim wittedness, but the reality exceeded all of the descriptions. Ferdinand's reign coincided with the zenith of the Bedemeyer cultural flowering in Austria. Bedemeyer architecture was distinct for its modesty in comparison with the ostentatious styles of the 18th century Rococo and the Baroque. In essence, it was a bourgeois style, a style directly patronised by the Emperor Francis. In the fine arts, this was the era of von Ameling, Peter Fendi and Henrik Weber. Yet it was in the arena of music that the influence of this period was most keenly felt. Mozart and Haydn of the First Vienna School were followed by Beethoven and Schubert. During the reign of Ferdinand, Schumann and Liszt attained their acclaim. Consistent with the theme of Gemütlichkeit, the music of Bedemeyer, was that of the leader, the song, and the piano, music that could be played in the comfort of the home. Beyond the confines of the home, this was also the era of the waltz. Gemütlichkeit, a sense of belonging, of acceptability, of cosiness, was the core of Bedemeyer not least because in an era of pervasive censorship, such themes as home and family were apolitical. Indeed, the Carlsbad era censorship had reached its apogee. 
commenting on the Austrian surveillance state, the Archduke Albert wrote of Ferdinand's reign. It could not have lasted a year, had not his predecessor enjoyed an unimpeachable reputation. Yet this comment does a strange disservice to Ferdinand. This, against a backdrop of accusations launched by British liberals in particular, that the emperor was at the head of a tyranny. Ferdinand, as the benevolent, was clearly following in the mould of his father, Francis the Good. In this sense, the emperor's amiability and his passivity were his greatest assets. He was an effective symbol of peacetime rule. Even during the revolution, the vitriol of the rioters on the streets was directed against the malign influence of Ferdinand's advisers. In a sense, the revolutionaries wished to reclaim their monarch. All these examples lend themselves to my view that Ferdinand was indeed King Gemütlichkeit, but a King Gemütlichkeit was clearly incapable of dealing with an existential threat to the empire. Ferdinand was uncharitably mocked when using the royal we. I've already referenced the power of Metternich. Nevertheless, we in German, wir, was taken as an anagram of Austria's greatest generals. The R in wir was taken as Radetzky, the victor against the Italian revolutionaries and the subject of Strauss Sr.'s Radetzky march. The influence of that campaign, not to mention the musical leitmotif it inspired, has given rise to the historian's expression of the reign of Ferdinand as the Volksmarz, literally the pre-march, the prelude to revolution. If Metternich hoped to find himself as an Austrian Richelieu, he'll be bitterly disappointed. For all his intrigues, Metternich was left with less influence than he had during the reign of the Emperor Francis. Francis had trusted Metternich implicitly, afforded him a significant level of autonomy, though not supremacy in the manner of a Bismarck vis-à-vis -vis Wilhelm I, the first German Kaiser. As has already been shown with the Archduchess Sophie, who dominated her husband and the heir presumptive, the Archduke Franz Karl, Metternich's role in the succession was bitterly resented by the imperial family. If Metternich had hoped to find an ally in the unassuming Archduke Ludwig, his co-triumvir, he instead proved to be a liability. Metternich's power provoked a reaction from the court in the form of Franz Anton von Kolowrat, a bohemian nationalist and minister of finance. Metternich spent 1835-6 toying with new ministries, council, even a Reichsrat and imperial assembly, for him to lead, to dominate Austria through institutions rather than through the acquiescence to the royal family. Metternich, who had been given pride of place in the Emperor's will, was forced into a power-sharing agreement with his bitter enemy, Kolovrat, a man whom Metternich had failed to exclude. Austria now had a non-emperor and a paralysed triumvirate. In dealing with the nationalities of the empire, Metternich had Ferdinand crowned in Hungary, in Bohemia, and in Italy, and failed to establish a coronation ritual for Austria itself. The diets of these respective nations pushed for greater autonomy, while the central government was incapable of serious reform, in the true spirit of Francis's wish to govern, but to change and disturb nothing. In 1846, there were revolutions in Italy, and in Austria and Galicia, the latter of which was brutally put down, Austria annexed the Polish revolutionary flashpoint in the independent city of Krakow. In 1848, a revolution deposed the King of France. Austria had been undisturbed by the French and Belgian revolutions of 1830. Nevertheless, 1848 represented a perfect storm of four major revolutionary elements converging on the empire all at once. Italian nationalism, German nationalism, Hungarian nationalism, and liberalism, opposed to the censorious regime built as a bulwark against the legacy of the French Revolution. Metternich fled Vienna on the 13th of March, and Kolovrat held the distinction of being Prime Minister for one month. Governments collapsed in quick succession. So it was during this time, in the wake of the fall of Metternich and Kolovrat, that the Archduchess Sophie came to dominate the imperial family. Though only a Habsburg by marriage, she resolved that her 18-year-old son, Franz Josef, must succeed for the sake of defeating the revolution and as the culmination of her own dynastic ambitions to rule vicariously through her son. Her husband had demonstrated a lack of leadership comparable to the Emperor Ferdinand, so he, by rights the heir, should be bypassed in the succession. This is a segment taken from Wheatcroft's The Habsburgs. In October of 1848, 
the situation in Vienna took a violent turn, one that Sophie had long expected. A last contingent of hussars under Count Lobkowitz had been sent by the commander of the Northern Army, one Prince Windischgratz, to protect the imperial family gathered within the ancient fortress walls of the Hofburg Palace. The hussars camped in the inner courtyard and stood guard at the doors and windows. The gates to the city were kept closed, but from within they could hear tumult in the streets. Late in the afternoon of the 6th of October, almost within sight of the windows, the naked body of the Minister of War, Count Latour, bestially mutilated, as contemporary accounts discreetly put it, and still bleeding profusely from countless cuts and slashes all over his body, was hanged from a lamp. Standard. Lobkowitz decided immediately that the imperial family would leave at dawn on the following day and seek the protection of Vindichgratz's large army. The night was spent in feverish packing and preparing the coaches for the long journey. Franz Josef wished, as an officer, to ride with the escort, but he was told that it was too dangerous and he should travel in a closed coach. After first light on Saturday the 7th of October, the outer gates of the Hofburg were opened and the first troop of hussars rode slowly out, their sabres drawn. They were followed by the first of the coaches, their blinds down, and surrounded on each side by lines of hussars with their carbines at the ready. A sharpshooter sat next to the driver, and others took place of their positions. The atmosphere was tense as the caravan of black coaches left, as if heading for Schonbrunn. The escort, the escort was prepared for an attack, especially at the city gate, but nothing happened. There were even some cheers for the emperor from the few Viennese around at the early hour who recognised the imperial crest on the coach. Within the hour, they were well beyond the city limits, and a sense of relief and anticlimax came over the whole party. The blinds of the coaches were raised to allow the thin winter light to reach the occupants, and the hussars sheathed their sabres and carbines. It is unlikely that the family was ever in any danger, for the people's anger was directed solely at the ministers and army commanders. Wrongly, the Viennese assumed, the emperor was unquestionably on the side of his people, evidence perhaps of the success of the imperial image fostered by Francis and inherited by Ferdinand. The procession of carriages travelled slowly, stopping about 20 miles from Vienna on the first night, and after crossing the Danube, headed for the town of Olmitz in Moravia, where the bishop's palace had been prepared as their temporary residence. They arrived on the 14th of October, just as a huge army led by Windischgratz was moving southeast against the city, which had recently been abandoned. The two events were not coincidental. As Windischgratz's forces manoeuvred and circled the city, it was the first time that Vienna had been besieged since the Turks encamped around it in 1683. The municipal council, after a few days of skirmishing in the suburbs, agreed to open the gates of their city and surrender. But then, hearing that a relieving force of their Hungarian allies was at hand, the citizens' militia repudiated the agreement and prepared to fight on. Vindischgratz, who had ranged over 200 artillery pieces around the city and was anxious to purge the city, relished the chance to take it by storm. The bombardment was concentrated and quite short, but it did enormous damage and cowed those within the walls. Engravings made at the time by artists standing with the general on the Kallenberg Hill showed the whole city lit up by innumerable fires from the shelling. When the army stormed the, um, stormed the city walls, there was little resistance, but a few die-hards made a stand, and the imperial troops sometimes had to fight from street to street. 2,000 armed citizens and non-combatants were killed in the bombardment and the fighting, and another 2,000 were arrested for sedition. But Austrian clemency was the rule and the victors abandoned the idea of a general purge. Only 25 of the leaders were shot, but a great many more citizen soldiers were conscripted and sent under guard to join the army in Italy. Those responsible for the murder of Latour were tried and immediately hanged. It was another month before the final scene was enacted. The senior Habsburgs, led by Archduke John, who had already decided that while Ferdinand was an acceptable figurehead for peacetime, supported by a strong team of ministers and advisers, he could not be expected to rule in such troubled times. However, no Habsburg had ever abdicated, although Maria Theresa and Joseph II had ruled in tandem. There was no constitutional provision under the family statute of 1839 for an emperor to abdicate. The assumption was that primogeniture would always operate as it had in Francis's last years when the question of his successor arose. 
he would not hear of the proper order established by the pragmatic sanction to be disturbed. It was God's will that Ferdinand should succeed him, and echoing the words of the Austrian national anthem, God would protect both the Emperor of Austria, whatever the circumstances. In the summer of 1848, the proposal was, as it had been in the 17th century when a succession to Emperor Matthias was agreed, that the throne should be handed to a new generation. Not only would Ferdinand abdicate, but he would be succeeded not by his brother, the next in line, but his nephew, who would only reach who would only reach his 18th birthday in August of 1848. Even then, he would not officially have come of age in a number of the Habsburg dominions. The deed was enacted on the early morning of the 2nd of September, 2nd of December, 1848, which was of questionable legality. In the 7th century, there had been only family custom. Now there was a legal family agreement, signed and binding on all parties. Nonetheless, setting all such doubts aside, orders had been issued by Ferdinand the previous evening for the family, and the local notables to assemble in a formal dress in the Grand Salon of the Bishop's Palace at 8 a.m. Sophie wore court dress of white moor silk and a jewelled rose in her hair. Franz Josef, Maximilian and Karl Ludwig wore uniform, and the six-year-old Ludwig Victor, a new suit appropriate to his age. None of the boys except Franz Josef had any idea why they had been summoned. The Emperor and the Empress amid complete silence, and the former read a short speech from a piece of paper handed to him by Prince Schwarzenberg, the new Prime Minister since October. He spoke in a low voice and stumbled over the words. It has been the motto of our government, he said, to be the protector of the law. It has been its aim to promote the welfare of its peoples, but the impact of events, the unmistakable and conclusive desire for far-reaching and comprehensive modification of constitutional reforms, which we have endeavoured to initiate in March of this year, have, however, convinced us that younger shoulders, so shoulders are needed to foster the lofty work and to bring it to a fruitful completion. Despite the various conditions, Ferdinand lived to the old age of 82. He lived the rest of his life in Prague, a phantom reign, holding a special dignity as Ferdinand V, the last crowned king of Bohemia. As Emperor of Austria, he inherited the mantra of his father, Francis, as the good. As Emperor Emeritus, Ferdinand would come to be known as Gudenand, the finished. <laughs>